Hello, and welcome to the How to Write Funny podcast. I am Scott Dickers, and today I'm joined by Michael Gerber, editor and publisher of American Bystander magazine. Michael, can you tell us all about American Bystander? It's a, a national print humor quarterly in trade paperback book format. And so that's been, that's been going on since about 2011, but our first issue came out in October of 2015. And so, um, yeah, that's what I do. So tell me about that, because, you know, I helped to start a um, newspaper slash magazine, and I found the, the distribution of it was incredibly difficult. I learned that yeah. the, <laughs> yes. mob, the mob essentially controls <laughs> right. newsstand distribution. <laughs> right. um, and here you are, you come out of, well, not exactly nowhere, we'll get into that, but yeah. you're starting a national humor magazine, and it's doing fine. And, yeah. you know, it took yeah. me years struggling with The Onion to get anyone to notice it, so... Of course. Uh, I'm curious well, to know yeah. like, what you've done in this short time to increase awareness of American Bystander. Well, Scott, it's really interesting. Before we go on to another, th- that topic, I want to say, you know, you, 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 were, you and I are really brothers under the skin because um, I remember I had done a, a, a parody of the Wall Street Journal in 1996, and it was an old-fashioned, like, off the Wall Street Journal that uh, Tony Hendra and that crew did in, in 80. Four, I think. Oh, like they did um, Sunday newspaper. Yeah, that they was, did Sunday. That was earlier, I guess. Yeah, that well, the, the Lampoon did the the Sunday the Sunday newspaper, and then in the eighties there were a couple of different um, full length kind of print parodies of newspapers, and the one that that, that that did the best was called Off the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, I don't. Think I had I saw said, that one. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think I have a copy. Else, I would have sent it. To, I, I'll send it to you. Um, but anyway, I was so. Uh, Pal and I put one together, and uh, we were looking to get it on the newsstand. We got a lot of, you know, back in the day, this is before the internet, really. Um, you know, we printed up a bunch of copies and sent them to a bunch of people, and they liked it. This is people in the magazine and newspaper business. And then, then the uh, the next step was to get it dis- uh, distributed uh, on newsstands. And I remember going, <laughs> I remember going to a Irish pub in Hell's Kitchen in, in 1996 to meet with a magazine distributor consultant. And the first thing he said, you know, I ordered, I was of course paying for lunch and I, uh, we ordered lunch and he put his menu down and then he said, now naturally you, you do have your $10,000 in paper bag, right? And I looked at him and I'm like, what? And he, he said, yeah, you know, to, to get on Hudson news at the airports and all the rest of that stuff, which is really what we wanted this thing. Um, he said, yeah, you gotta, there's, there's a lot of cash that has to, uh, change hands yeah. so yeah it's it's a, it, what i always used to call it was it's as crooked as a dog's hind leg i mean news newsstand distribution is a is a cash business and so it was uh pretty pretty awful so did you manage to crack that nut then with this one i i have not um i have not and and the interesting thing about bystander is uh after 25 years of trying to solve those problems um, with Bystander, basically, I just said we're going to use the internet to run around them, um, and that is still ongoing. Uh, but but I'm very pleased to say that the that the the creative side, well, because you know this, it's like what you can do creatively has to do with your format, and your format is is determined by your distribution. And so, you know, so so like these these middlemen were determining everything about about what print comedy could be, how often it could come out, what kind of formats it could use, all that sort of thing. Um, and the, the thing about The Bystander was, and, and this has to do with the story behind it, that I basically just put something together that I thought would be, you know, like the ultimate grown-up college humor magazine with no, no quarter asked or given for advertisers or distribution, just making it, as, as neat as we could possibly make it, and then using social media to try to spread the word on that. And that, is, that has been working. Um, the other thing is, is that when you, when you do it like this with distribution, and I don't know, did you guys ever do a lot of newsstand, even in like, like uh, Madison and Boulder and stuff? The Onion was distributed free on the street, so okay. where there were piles of other newspapers that were Okay. You know, distributed for free, it would be there, and then on occasion we'd we'd be on newsstands like in Borders or whatever. And I don't know what 
what machinations <laughs> led to that particular <laughs> outlet of distribution because it's free. So it's not like they're making any money. Huh. So I don't know how that happened. I think we would send it to people uh-huh. for free and, you know, mm-hmm. some good hearted borders or Barnes and Noble <laughs> employee would just put it on the stand. I don't know, but yeah, no, it, that, it just seemed like an impossible ivory tower to get in. And then you can't, you must've come in at just the right time when the internet allowed you to compete. Mm. Well, I, I want, before we continue with that, I just want to say, you know, I was, I was around during that time. You guys were in Madison doing your thing. I was in New York trying to start a national humor magazine. Uh, and I, when I heard about you guys and I saw the print, the print, uh, the print edition, this was a lot of the things that I was walking around big magazine companies saying this is how to do it. Um, the regionalization of it, the, um, the sort of college towny part of it, um, you, you, you know, you did something really interesting blending that, uh, that um, alternative weekly model with the humor magazine model. It was really fascinating and, and it didn't surprise me that it worked like crazy. Well, that was the, the genius of Tim Keck, one of the founders who came from a family of newspaper people and it was it was all him you know the idea to <laughs> meld a weekly newspaper with comedy yeah but, i mean there were things like that there were like the comics only type of newspapers that you'd see uh-huh. around stuff like that uh-huh. but the the funny thing about that is i'm curious to know more about the magazine you were trying to start at that time oh yeah i'll but, tell you all about that stuff yeah one mm-hmm. one thing i wanted to say was like I hear, I hear what you're saying that you thought we were doing everything right, but it, it took the onion a good 10 years mm-hmm. before anyone ever heard of it. So mm-hmm. we, mm-hmm. it may have been the quote unquote right way to do it, but it was the right. slow way. There's no right. question about it. Right. Right. Well, but you know, this is what's interesting because I, I really thought, I, I, I really thought editorially that helped you guys so much because you didn't, a lot of what I was struggling with in New York is that when, because I was in New York, uh, because I'd come from Yale's Humor Magazine and went straight down and they had that bona fides and all that, you know, um, like from the get go, there were all of these restrictions that I was being told that I had to do um, editorially to be able to be considered a, a, an actual, you know, national magazine or something real or whatever. So it was it was actually pretty tough because I was 23, 24, 25 you know, living in a tiny little apartment and tenting and going into these meetings. And, you know, I would start out the meeting by saying, well, of course we know that, you know, all the print humor out now, because I didn't know about you guys, um, you know, all of it's kind of shitty. And then they would turn around and say, well, you know, to do for us to take you seriously, for us to give you any kind of money for this meeting to go forward, you're going to have to do exactly what, you know, the late period National Lampoon and late period Spy were already doing. And that was very frustrating and disheartening. So when I found out about you guys, I thought to myself, well, this is fantastic because it seemed like you guys were doing well financially or well enough to continue. And it allowed you to be in that, that submarine together and really create something wonderful and special. And if, if it had gotten any bigger, any faster, it would, I think it would have been much more difficult because you would have run into all the idiots that I was running into who were like, you know, you have a bunch of 45 year old men trying to figure out what 16 year old girls like. I mean, that's crazy. Like it never works. So uh, with magazines that what has always frustrated me is when they're really good, I love them and they're wonderful. Like, like, uh, you know, Lampoon of the early seventies or, uh, or spy and it's first couple of years or even something like Harold Hayes's Esquire in the sixties. I mean, there's nothing better than a great magazine, but the thing that all of those magazines have in common is that they are really created for the enjoyment of the people who are putting them together, not from this demographic first attitude. And, and that's what you have in the magazine business now where, you know, when I was in New York, uh, there were, there were all these assumptions as to what a humor magazine was, who it appealed to, what kind of advertisers you could get, what, what you couldn't. Um, so it was, it was awful. I mean, it was like it, it, you were sort of shot in the foot before you even began. And that was what was great about you guys, because as I was walking around, you know, like showing a parody, 20 page parody, of the Wall Street Journal printed out, you know, like on newsprint, here you go. Uh, there was no belief that 
you know, I would say, well, in the 70s, National Lampoon did wonderfully, or in the early 80s, or in the mid-80s, Spy did wonderfully, or this is a parody of the Wall Street Journal from 1985. And I remember the publisher of Rolling Stone at the time just, like, ripping ripping me up one side and down the other, saying things are totally different now. It's 1996. <laughs> like, so it was particularly great when I um, discovered The Onion, because you guys were successful, and you were absolutely uncompromising in your quality, your editorial quality. And people were responding to that. And, and I just was, I took so much heart from it. Well, there's a whole dichotomy there between what they used to call selling out and now they call going legit, which, <laughs> which is where you fold whatever your vision is into under the umbrella of some kind of corporate mission statement mm -hmm. where they bankroll you, they give you offices, and they tell you what you can and can't do. Mm -hmm. Or you can do it on your own. and just be an independent, be an island where you're just struggling out there in the trenches, right. selling ads or trying to sell subscriptions or t-shirts or whatever you can sell to justify your continuing payroll. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in the old days, that was a little bit more of a Faustian choice where mm -hmm. I'm going to go with the big company mm -hmm. and everything's going to happen faster for me mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they're, they have distribution and they have finances and I'm going to be set up. Whereas mm -hmm, right. the other route was much slower, but you get to maintain your integrity. And now I just don't feel like that choice is there anymore. It's like mm -hmm. now everybody's doing it on their own because they can, because the internet makes it so affordable. Mm -hmm, right. And what that essentially becomes is a farm team for the big companies. If they see something they right. like, they might suck it up and right. they, then they'll, they'll pay somebody, you know, a few million dollars to acquire whatever right. great thing they have right. going. <laughs> right. and, and so, you know, then you, then you sell it and, and then good luck to you. Like then, then you right. really, you, you're, you've made the Faustian choice <laughs> again. Right. Right. What is your view on that? Like, do you see this as something that you're going to keep doing to maintain the editorial integrity? Or is this something that you're hoping Hearst or Condé Nast <laughs> notices at some point and yeah. says, we're going <laughs> to, we're going to make this a, a newsstand magazine. They're going to notice it and they're going to go, this is crazy. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's funny, Scott. Uh, I think for my generation, I, I remember, you know, I, I, I was fascinated with, I was fascinated with print humor and print humor magazines when I was five. Don't ask me why, but I, I really, I really loved it. I uh, really loved them. And then um, when I was 12, I remember reading an article in Esquire magazine about Doug Kenny after his death. It was a Robert C. Manson article and was talking. It was called Life and Death of a Comic Genius. And I remember reading that and relating to it so, so much. Um, and, of course, part of that story is the, you know, the three Harvard guys, uh, uh, Doug and Henry and Rob Hoffman, selling out yes. after five years for the equivalent. I think the, it was seven and a half million dollars, but it was the equivalent of something like twenty five million dollars today. And so, you know, I think after that deal, I think it's hard not to look at if you start a national humor magazine, if you're my generation, and think, well, that's, you know, if we're really successful, that's what happens. Now, of course, <laughs> Henry seems to have, you know, gone into um, semi-seclusion for, for, for the intervening, intervening 50 years. Doug died, and Rob, uh, who I was lucky enough to speak to before he died, didn't live to be very... I mean, it wasn't like they wasn't, I don't think it was happily ever after, but so, you know, I bring this up because I remember the, um, the guys at, uh, at spy thing. I think that they, they might've gone into that thinking that there was going to be a payday like that well, because I was, and there was for them. This is what I heard. And I'm not, I could be wrong is that they were, everybody was made whole, but nobody walked away with a big check. And, and that was interesting, and that's interesting in general because Spy is such a fascinating publishing story. Um, I would say that, you know, Spy's, both Spy's incredible, um, uh, it's, in, it's incredible sort of influence on publishing has come, came from its incredibly tight focus, but it, it never allowed, it was never able to break national like National Lampoon did, so it never really generated the kind of, advertising dollars that, that, that you need to, to walk away. You know, so this is a long way of answering your question. And so the, 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 answer, the answer is for me, 
that um, this is the thing that I'm best at in the world. And it actually has come about after a, a, a long, very serious illness, which made me feel like I was never going to be able to work again. So I'm very grateful that um, it, it has happened. Um, I'm also cognizant that, that it's, you know, it, it relies on my uh, insane dedication at this point. So I'm really trying to figure out how to systematize and institutionalize it a little bit. Um, if somebody came at me with an offer and I felt that, that the structure and the um, uh, aesthetic was strong enough that it could withstand that kind of, with a corporate parent or a different kind of parent than just a crazy person, um, then I would consider that just because, you know, I'm 48 and, and, you know, I've starved. So, you know, you don't turn that down. But at the same time, I don't have any great illusions about um, being better at doing something else or being... I mean, my job is great. I, I spend, uh, it doesn't pay me, but I spend a lot of time getting material from people who I really respect and telling them that I think they're wonderful and then running their stuff. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, so, you know, I get, that, that may seem kind of a wishy-washy answer, but I, I want to give you the true answer. If I found the right partner and I felt it was somebody who could really grow it, then I would say absolutely, because there are lots of things that I can't do just as an individual. Um, but I'm not, I'm not interested in handing it over to somebody who's going to turn it into National Lampoon circa 1983. I, I just don't, I don't think that would work. And, and I don't think that that, I don't think my contributors would, would, um, uh, appreciate that. And yeah, that's, that's not, that's the world doesn't need that. So no amount of money would, uh, <laughs> would make you feel comfortable with a new owner firing you and firing all those writers, all those great, oh, great yeah. human writers that you have and well, re replacing someone, them with if hacks. Anyone's, <laughs> if anyone's listening to this, if anyone with money is listening to this, come buy the magazine and fire me and all the writers and then do that. And then we'll run something else <laughs> that, that's not called the bystander. Um, you just start you know, it again. I mean, but this is the thing. And, and I, because, because, and this is so interesting that you say it like that. I mean, what people love about the bystanders is that old-fashioned print humor, classic print humor magazine feel. And that's what I've always loved. That's, that's what I've always been obsessed with. That's the kind of magazine that I, that I tried to run when I was resurrecting the Yale Humor Magazine when I was a kid. That's the, all the magazine dummies that I was making, stealing time at Kinko's on Astor Place in the mid-90s. You know, like those were the, printing out these, these magazine dummies. Those were all the ones. It felt sort of like... Nash, early National Lampoon, sort of like Harold Hayes Esquire, circa 1967, sort of, you know, I mean, it's all the stuff I like. So uh, what I truly, what this experience has been more than anything else is I'm just delighted that, that people dig what I dig. Um, because if you go into the, the publishing business, it's, we are 180 degrees away from what they would say would be successful editorially or publishing or anything. So... Just going back for a second more on the whole sellout idea, mm -hmm. the National Lampoon and Spy Magazine, regardless of how Spy went down, and I, I did hear it differently. I heard that they mm -hmm. they made money, but they weren't asked to stay on. So Which, the, that's the, the mag, weird. it's bizarre. Right. Whoever that's whoever weird. would invest that money yeah. and tell the two geniuses behind it to, to right. okay, you can leave now is insane. Right. But regardless, right. the, the <laughs> lesson to be learned, and you know, at the onion we tried to learn this lesson, which was when you make celebrities out of the creators like Doug Kenny at the Lampoon mm -hmm. or writers like John Hughes or any of the other great people who wrote for the Lampoon. When those people would leave or move on to work for movies or right. if the Lampoon was bought, like people knew it right. and immediately they'd be like, oh, well, it's not going to be funny anymore. It's not as good. Yeah. And Spy Magazine, it loses its two guys. It's not funny anymore. So yeah. that's why we never put names on anything at The Onion. We wanted The that's Onion really itself to be the brand. That's really interesting. And you're doing something very similar by putting everything under the banner of American Bystander. You just said something very funny that if somebody came and gave you a bunch of money, you'd just start it again with a different title. But the big lesson in all that is that the title is important because it's the brand that people associate mm. with, with the look and the quality and everything mm. else. So mm. when The Onion was in real turmoil mm -hmm. in the early 20 teens mm -hmm. and the business office wanted to consolidate everybody from New York, all the editorial in New York, bring them into Chicago under the same roof as the business team. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to make the move. 
And it was a very wrenching time, and a lot of people quit or were fired and stayed in New York. And a tiny fraction of the, the staff actually moved to Chicago. Huh. But no reader ever knew that because the brand was still the same, looked right. the same. <laughs> and right. so, right, right. And also, we invested a ton of time and effort in the system, uh -huh. the system that we use for, and the voice was very clear. But mm -hmm. to any other magazine, uh, that would have been the death now. <laughs> yeah, right. And so, right. if you do, you know, you could do that, but if you did, I think you'd find you'd be starting at square one. It wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to tell all your readers necessarily, hey, we just have a different name now, but it's all the same people. It would take the same amount of years that it took to build up what you have now. Well, again, let me, let me tell you the story behind it because we're launched into no, it. No, it's fine. I also realize we're, we're having a conversation that's relevant to like 0.0001% <laughs> of the well, comedy audience. And that is people who own a valuable brand and but, are but, questioning whether they should sell out or not. But, here, but here's, in, here's the interesting thing about that. Because I always looked at you guys and I thought, God, I want to know who the writers are. I want to know who the writers are. Um, and with Bystander, I think it's fascinating that, 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 you, that you look at the magazine, you see the brand, because I don't look at it that way at all. I look at it totally as the writers. Totally as a contrib individual well, I, contributor. I do too. I'm not saying you know I, I mean? do. I'm saying that among the populace, like that's, See, that would, that's totally fascinating to me because I think you guys, I mean, you guys were, it was like, you were like the Soviet hockey team of comedy. I mean, you know, like it was just, every article was just absolutely machined. Every page, everything was, the, the aesthetic was just tuned perfectly. Well, thank you. It was really, really interesting in that way. Um, well, by the way, often, we're talking about the onion far more in this episode of the podcast <laughs> than I ever have. Well, then you know, but you, we are talking you, about I, magazines. It's relevant. Yeah, trust, you know, I trust you to edit it the way that you want to edit it. But I, we'll I, edit all I think this it's, out. I think it's fascinating. You know, don't lose it because I think this is fascinating stuff. And I have thought about. I mean, when I say that I was interested in humor magazines at age five, I would buy them all and rip them up and, and reconfigure them and tape them back together in the order that I liked them. I mean, it's really wow. kind of like, yeah, it was weird. And I, and I don't really know, I don't know why I did it. But, um, but so whenever I looked at the onion, it was like, I was look, I was sort of looking at the bones of it. And going, oh, how's that? How's that work? Okay. David, oh, David Malky's perfect for the comic section. That's great. That's a good get like all that stuff. And I was just so impressed with the level of, um, precision that the, you guys showed. Um, I tend to, and all of my stuff, I tend to, I don't know how to put it. It's almost like the, 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 the mistake in a Navajo blanket. I always try to put something like that in there. Um, because what I'm really interested in, um, is, is not the, is not this Kubrickian kind of creation, which you guys are really good at, but, but it's, but it, but it kind of warm, a little warmer and a little messier. Um, and some people like that and some people think it's a flaw. And I've, I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with some fans who love my work for that very reason. Cause they always, where's the Beatle reference? The Beatles reference has got to be in there somewhere, even though it has nothing to do with what I'm writing. Um, or, and then others are like, no, no, no. And I think it was interesting because you guys really changed. I worked with the students at the Yale record for 20 years and you guys really changed all, what a whole generation thinks sounds funny. Like what, something funny is and, and that and that precision and kind of distance almost it, it, it's like Kubrickian it's like that precision um that is what people think that that is the style what people uh default to now it's fascinating stuff yeah that is one of the drawbacks of the onion's existence is that every college humor publication <laughs> yes. now does fake news yeah. Yes, that's and that's all they, they want to do. do. Yeah. So what's your background? How did you get into this? So my background is I grew up in St. Louis, and um, my mom was a single mom, and she was going to art school. This was the early 70s, early to mid-70s. And um, so I was just around a lot of artists, a lot of writers and artists. And as I said, you know, my mom, being the age she was, she read National Lampoon, and I remember National Lampoon and, and like head comics and all that sort of stuff around when I was tiny, three, four, five years old. Um, later, 
when I started getting interested in it as a writer, as you know, this was 11, 12, 13 years old, I would go and investigate, this is the early 80s, in 82, something like that. I would go and investigate these old head shops trying to find old copies of National Lampoon. And I would find them, things I hadn't seen since I was three, and these, these weird, it was like the, um, you know, my rosebud. Um, you know, you'd see a cover. You'd be like, oh, I remember that. So, um, you know, that was always my interest. Uh, I was interested in history. I wanted to be a historian or a comedy writer. That was sort of my two things. And uh, I had a high school. I w- went to a high school, a big public high school outside of Chicago, Oak Park River Forest High School, which had a great newspaper. Uh, and as a senior, I was I was too shy uh, before this. I was just writing stuff in my notebooks. But somebody stole a notebook of mine and, and sent it or sent it to the journalism professor and the journalism professor. Uh, said, yes, he should be on the paper, but he's got to take the class. And so I sort of was snuck in the back door. But people liked that humor column enough so that I got into Yale. And I knew wherever I was going to go, I was going to try to run the humor magazine. And it was a very interesting time to go to Yale because, one, um, the place was in real disrepair. Uh, This was 87. New Haven was a complete bomb zone because because of crack. Um, they were really at that college, they were really uncertain about their own identity. Um, you know, if you're Harvard, you know, well, our identity is we're the oldest and the richest and the this and the that and everybody else. It was, it was interesting. So there was a sense of after the sixties and seventies, everybody throwing off all this old stuff, all this Thurston Hell the third type stuff. But then I came in not being from that in genera- not being from that environment at all. And seeing this and, for example, seeing the Yale Record, which was this old in and out of business humor magazine, the oldest one in the country, as a huge opportunity to be renovated, to be remade, uh, not as a, you know, a a museum piece, but actually something that, that you use the sort of structure of it and the tradition of it to create something that is fundamentally more inclusive, fundamentally more interesting um, than, than was before. And so... For the first couple of years at Yale, I was um, I was a, a newspaper columnist, humor columnist, and got a following for that. And then um, after at the end of my sophomore year, resurrected the record, which has been tried to be done for 20 years since Gary Trudeau had 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 it. He he was the last one before it went out of business, and it was really interesting, Scott, because I people were very um, wary of it. They were very wary of anything that was old. Um, They were very wary of the way that humor can be used to kind of, well, we see it now a lot with Trump, humor can be used to repress. Um, And it took a while for me to convince people that I wasn't interested in any kind of P.J. working in fantasy, you know, scenario, but that I really wanted to use the institution to create something that was fundamentally more open. And that and that, I have to say, has been successful. It's one of the things that I'm most proud of. Um, and so then I graduated in 91. Uh, I did a big parody of this, the ill-fated National Sports Daily. Frank DeFord just died. Uh, and I did a parody of that my senior year. And this was all interesting because what allowed me to resurrect the record was that uh, Desktop Publishing came along. So instead of spending $3,000 to typeset an issue, you could do it yourself. And so um, because the technology, because I was in tune with that technology, not only was I able to do things like resurrect the record, I also was able to learn how to design and edit and publish and write. Now, I often think I'm not as good a writer as I could be because I had to learn all those other things. (laughs) Um, But that's why the bystander exists is that I'm somebody who can do all of those things. And uh, I've been forced to do it because if I didn't, nobody was going to come along and say, yeah, I'll publish it for you or yeah, I'll design it for you. So, well, let me ask you about the Yale record because I've seen it and I, I lived in Connecticut for a while and obviously was in New York with the onion for many years. And I hired an intern from the Yale record and who'd you hire? Uh, Ian Dallas. I don't know if you know. Ian was one of my favorite people of all time. (laughs) That's great. Ian is, and do you know what Ian is doing now? Ian's a video game designer. He's tremendously successful. Oh, that's fantastic. Ian is, was one of the, um, 
was one of the most original minds that I've ever run across. He was, yeah. And he contributed he some ideas for the onion. And I went and did the uh, master's tea over there one oh, time. Right. And I was always impressed with the Yale record because from what I understand, they accept outside submissions. Like you don't have to be at Yale to well, run a story. Is that true? It's, you know, they're sort of in it. That, that is something that I was trying to institute because th- when you were doing this, this was 97, 98, I guess. I had, um, I had just really started working with them. I started, I worked with them from 94 to about 2014. I, I worked with them intensely. Um, and with Ian, I was trying to, because I saw who he was, you know, I would, I would look and see if there was somebody who was really special, I would say, well, what can we, what can we do with this thing that will really be worthy of them, that person? And with Ian, I really looked at it and thought, well, this guy could be running as big a magazine, a big a college magazine as, as you, as you can give him. So, um, yeah, we were looking with him. I was trying to get, trying to kick the record into some sort of, yeah, like regional or, or quasi college thing. Um, in part, Scott, because I knew that Ian could, could edit it properly, you know, that he could take outside submissions, that he knew what to do when the piece wasn't about dining hall food, you know? And so, uh, what, what happened after the record, which was very interesting after Ian left, then there was this period, there's always this in period of inhaling and exhaling after Ian left. Um, it went through a, a tough time. And so I had been down in New York trying to figure out how to publish it properly, how to publish a college magazine properly, because I thought that there had to be a way to do it. Um, and I figured it out. And in 2003, I had been going up to New Haven regularly and talking to the students and wanting them to change the publishing model, because I felt that if you change the publishing model, it would start to make money. If it started to make money, you'd print it more frequently, then you'd get better talent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm always interested in whatever I do with being as generous as possible. Like, you know, like, yes, it's, it's by Yale students, but yes, you can, outsiders can contribute into it. Or, um, you know, we're trying, we, we do it, but we do it for charity or something like that. Just anything can, to keep the quality up? Well, yeah, but I also think the generosity is so important in comedy, um, and so that's one of the things I was always trying to teach them. But in any case, in 2003, they went through another kind of shitty period. And I had made some money from a parody of Harry Potter. And so I went up to New Haven and I said, look, I will buy the back cover and I, for every issue. And I'll give you as much as you need to keep you in business if we try this new print model. And they said, sure, because they didn't have any better ideas. And it's, it's this super, super efficient um, tech, it's it's sort of based on a certain kind of technology, a kind of printer, um, and it allows you to really be very tight about how many people you're reaching and how many copies you're printing, uh, which which takes all the riskiness out of publishing. Um, they made money from the first issue, and they've made money ever since. They're now a profitable monthly, which is wonderful. Um, the quality, I'm always, you know, now other people are handling the alumni stuff and I'm always railing at them to make the quality better. But from a publishing standpoint, it was really interesting. And pretty much throughout the early 2000, the 2000s, yeah, 2005 to 2015, I would teach college students this method of publishing humor, humor magazines, but you could use it for any kind of magazine. And the ones that actually follow it, they make money and it's, and it's great. The, a lot of the same principles are what uh, ended up in the bystander. Wow. So. so, yeah, and I learned that about you recently, that you've been doing that sort of mentoring with people. But I want to take you back to sure. initially when you got on the Yale record and desktop publishing was new. Because yeah. like in 1987, you would have had like a Mac lunchbox computer, you know, with, with Mick Draw or something. Yeah, that's exactly right. We'd put, we'd do issues page maker. on. Yeah, page, page maker. That's exactly right. Uh, we, we'd, uh, we'd use an, a Mac SE 30. I remember we'd use a Mac SE 30 and you typeset it and then you cut it out. Stop me if you know this, but you typeset it, then you cut, then you print it, you print it out then you cut it and you paste it down on Bristol board. You paste it down on the yeah. stiff white board. That's exactly what we did at the end. You'd I'm wax, sure. wax it with hot wax and all that. It's, that's exactly right. And so that's what we were doing. And so for me, you know, it was really interesting because that was a wonderful time to be doing this stuff. Like the zine revolution and all these Xerox and all this great, 
you know, there was that sort of Paul Mavridi's, um, you know, Church of the Subgenius cutout right. stuff. I mean, you, it was, were, you were doing it just like you used to do it as a kid, too. Yes. Like the tactile yes. cutting and putting in yes. place. And, and writing and drawing. And sometimes I'd write on the, the pages and it, it, because it was, because for me, it was so interesting. And this is, this is still what I'm interested in, is this idea of the public and the personal. Like you're always playing with the public and the personal where, um, you know, yes, it's an institution and, you know, there are all these amazing, the bystander, yeah, there's all these amazing people and blah, 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 blah. But it's really just me. Honestly, it's really just me sitting in front of my computer in my living room in Santa Monica um, putting together the issue. And so there's, there's always that, for me, there's always that tension and it's a, a wonderful thing to play with. I mean, like I say, you guys were much more kind of polished, like, like, like I say, the Soviet hockey team of, com- of comedy magazines, you know. Um, but, but for me, I was always playing and continue to play with this idea of it's just me. You know, I've even thought about this, this for every issue. I think to myself, oh, I should have in little tiny mice type on every page what I'm listening, what the, what the, the song that I'm listening to as or the song that you should listen to as you're, as you're reading this article. Wow. You know? Yeah, that's such a different aesthetic from the way. But, you know, that's what makes comedy so interesting is that it's so personal and everybody <laughs> brings their, their own personal take to it. And their personality is what oftentimes gives it that unique edge, you know? Yeah. So, and, but I do want to say too, I mean, like, this is the thing. It's like, I have always just been a voice out in the wilderness, you know? And so that's how you, you just kind of, I was talking to a friend of mine who's an artist and she was saying, Oh, I don't know. Jesus Christ. I don't know what I'm doing. I, you know, I, I feel like I'm totally out of step. I said, lean into that feeling, lean into that out of stepness. So then how did the bystander come about? That's why the bystander exists is I just went, Screw it. You know, like, uh, I'm going to do one issue of a magazine that I think would be good with all the people that I want to read, and I'm not going to pay any attention to any, particularly what the comedy business says. I'm particularly not going to pay attention yeah, to Yeah, and, it, you know, if you look at the American Bystander, it's like, it does not feel in the woods. It feels almost like comedy establishment because of all the big names. <laughs> yes, you know, you right. may laugh, but it, it, you look at it and it's like, oh, well, this is an important magazine. Like that's your, that's your initial reaction to it. I know. It, I know. And it's, it's all freaking sleight of hand. It's all a certain kind of design and a certain kind of editorial voice that I'm, you know, that's, that's real, but also to let's not take it too seriously. And it's all the people. Around 2011, 2012, I uh, was dealing with a chronic illness that I thought was going to kill me. And um, I had developed this thing. It hit me when I was a senior in college and it had gotten steadily worse. And if you don't mind, I, can you go into the yeah. details on that? Was it? Of course I can. Was it? I say, I say it because people don't talk about this kind of stuff. And once you have it and you start talking to people about this kind of thing, people go, Oh yeah, I had that. Or, Oh, I've had that experience. You know, we don't talk about the times when, when, when the shit really hits the fan. Um, I can tell you, it was like I had food poisoning every day. That's the, that's the easiest way to put it. Um, when I was a senior in college, we, we sort of put this back together. 20 years later, we, we figured out, my doctors and I figured out when it hit me. And then, oh, this is what must have happened. But um, when I was a senior in college, New Haven is incredibly dreary in the spring, in the winter and the spring. It's just raw. And the winter turning to spring of my Senior year was particularly dire, just like sleet every day. And I remember getting flu, and I didn't kick it. I mean, I, I kicked it eventually. I took some antibiotics, took some Cipro. This was back in 91. People were not really too up on what, what antibiotics can do to you. Um, and so looking back 25 years um, people now, my doctors now think that what happened was I got a flu, it turned my immune system on, and it never turned off. Uh, and that can sometimes happen that your immune system doesn't, doesn't, you know, go off high alert. Then at the same time, I took the Cipro, which just absolutely wrecked, wrecked, ruined, whatever you want to say, all, all of my... Your uh, gut biome. Like, yeah, the biome. And I, of course, I was so young and strong, I didn't even notice. One thing that was interesting was that when I graduated from college, this was three months later, I, started, I developed real severe lactose intolerance, which I'd never had before. 
And when I was home, when I was a kid, all the women, I was really raised by mostly women. It was great. It was just as great as it sounds. Um, and they would grab me and they would grab my hair because my dad uh, had some Sicilian in his background. I had this great thick hair. And fast forward to when I graduated from college, three months after I'd gotten this flu, my mother grabbed me and she grabbed my hair and she said, what is that barber doing to your hair? And I said, I don't know. I'm 21. I don't think of that kind of stuff. And she said, it's, it's so thin. It's thinner. And now looking back, it was my body. I was starting to not be able to digest my food particularly well. So anyway, fast forward throughout my 20s, you know, it, it incrementally uh, got more and more serious and more and more difficult to deal with. There would be more and more things that I would have really severe um, intolerance, intolerance reactions to. Of course, I was going to every doctor. I was going to allergists. They weren't finding anything. Um, but, but for most of my 20s, and of course, my 20s were hard because I was in the publishing business try in New York, trying to start national humor magazines or do comedy things, you know, writing. In my, my 20s were crazy. I mean, it took, this would give you an idea, it took us five years, my writing partner and I, my writing partner is a good friend of mine from Yale. It took us five years to find the fact, to get the fax number for Saturday Night Lodge Weekend Update. And of course, once we finally did, once they let us in, we ended up, you know, writing a ridiculous amount of material for them for $50 a joke or whatever it was. But anyway, it was just a very, very tough time. And, um, you know, I left New York and written for, you know, wrote for all the places you write for SNL and um, the New Yorker and all that sort of stuff, but never was able to make ends meet. And that sort of chronic stress, I'm sure, did not help. Moved back to Chicago because my wife um, uh, is, uh, was there. Uh, my fiance and, and now my wife. Um, and, you know, I was around 30 when I, I just was, I was fed up with it all. I had given everything I could to comedy writing. I loved it, loved it and ate, ate you know, breathed and slept it, um, but could not make a living doing it. Never was, uh, never was uh, taken to the breast of any of these institutions and in fact uh, felt you know, sort of had many opportunities, had many uh, situations where I felt actually <laughs> actively sabotaged. Um, I'd been working, you know, I'd been fighting against the mighty Harvey, Harvard Lampoon uh, Mafia the, the entire time. And I was just like, fuck it, I'm, I'm done with this. Um, but somebody asked me to do a parody of Harry Potter, just just a single chapter uh, to see if, if there was a book there. And they knew that I loved Board of the Rings. And I asked my wife, I said, you know, what's this about these Harry Potter books? Lord of the Rings being the National Lampoon's parody of Lord of the Rings. Right. It came out in the 70s, I think. Uh, 69. 69, so it was, yeah. It was, it was Doug and Henry, Doug, Kenny and Henry Beard's parody of uh, Lord of the Rings, which was basically like the setup for National Lampoon. It was the thing that made Maddie Simmons go, hmm, I think I can actually fund a magazine on this. So anyway, I love that thing. And somebody said, well, why don't you write a, why don't you write a chapter? And so... I told my, asked my wife, because my wife's a big fantasy and science fiction fan, but she said, listen, if you're going to parody Harry, you, you can't make fun of him. It's great. And I said, oh, I don't have any intention to. I, I, so I read it, and I thought, these are, these are wonderful. I don't have any interest. I'm, you know, I, my point in doing this parody is not going to be like, you know, to have everybody wake up to how shitty Harry Potter is. Um, I did, the, I did this, the, the first chapter, and... Um, First, this editor, this book editor who asked me to do it said, I love it. We can't publish it. And then I got an agent who was not a very, let's say he was not the right fit. He shopped it around and everybody said, um, I love it, but, but, but you know, Warner Brothers is going to sue. Now, I knew that I had written it right in line with all of the, um, with all of the precedents for parody. Um, so I knew that if it did get sued, we would have a case and it would really come down to whether we wanted to fight it or not. So, uh, as of 2001, and once again, remember I was doing this to sort of say sayonara. Thank you. For, thank you. Comedy writing. It's been fun. Um, self-publish it. Asked my, my fiance the week of our marriage, can I self-publish it? She said, we've got nothing for them to take. So why don't you? 
Now, how do you uh, self-publish a book? Now, I've done it, but people listening may have no idea how you self-publish a book in 2001. Well, back in, yeah, back in those days, it wasn't, it wasn't that much different than it was today. Um, oh, so you, you're talking about online then? No, I was talking, it's print. I, would, I did it in print. Okay. So I did it just like, um, you know, just like any of the, the issues of the Yale record I'd done or the, uh, or the parodies of, of the Wall Street Journal or anything. I just got a cover and, you know, went into PageMaker or whatever we were using then, in design maybe by then, and, um, and designed the book, designed the book block, type, you know, did all the typo- typography and made it look like a Harry Potter book, you know, got the right typefaces and stuff. And, um, and I'm happy to say that, that once it came out and I didn't get sued, um, an American publisher came in, Simon Schuster came in, and then Orion in England came in, and lo and behold, it became a craze. So, you know, it was like sayonara comedy writing, no, 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 wait. <laughs> so now for a couple of years, I started doing novels, parodies of novels. I did, so I did about seven or eight of those. That got to the point where um, the publishers were, were basically throwing up any any old crap that people were writing and calling it a parody. And so they killed the market. Um, I had an experience in 2000, I think it was 2011 where um, somebody called me up, a big publisher in New York called me up, asked me to do a parody of Downton Abbey, said to me that they'd always wanted to work with me, um, offered me 35,000 bucks to do it, but they said we need it very quickly. I said, okay, I can do it for you in six weeks because that's the kind of writer I used to be, but I have to design it at the same time. Because I, I really needed to even write to space. Like, I have 16 pages here. I'm going to write 16 pages. Um, so, hit my mark. Got them the book. I think it's the best parody that I ever did, Downtown Abbey. Because it, I learned a new way to do parodies while I was doing that. Tell me about that. Oh, learned a new way of doing parodies? Yeah. Well, um, I always felt that I was obligated to to come up with a new plot or to come up with, to, to, to distance myself from the original significantly. And one of the things that I think made Board of the Rings so good was that they used the same plot. And with Downtown Abbey, what I was doing was I was actually going through, I had broken down, I believe this is right, there are 13 episodes in that season, there are 13 chapters in my book. I actually went through watching each episode over and over and over again, doing what, you know, my wife's business, she's a television writer, you know, like logging it. And, and, and so I was doing a sort of basic one-to-one parody. But then as I did that, I was also laying in new stories, new character, all that sort of stuff. So um, that was a way to get close to the original, but also to not be boring. And that, to me, that's really one of the things I struggled with one of the things I struggled with so much when I was a writer is that I get bored so easily. So uh, this was a way for me to, to, to get close, which is, of course, what readers love. They love that specificity. And the verisimilitude. Uh, that's everything. Yeah, 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 right. That, that, and, and this was what was so frustrating about first the Barry Trotter and then later the, the Downtown Abbey. Um, publishers get frightened by the verisimilitude. They, they think that that's going to make them more suit-worthy. Right. It's not actually. It, it it doesn't make you any more suit worthy, um, but it's an. Imp- you and I know this stuff in like reflexively. Yeah, but I, when you, I know what you're talking about. When you talk to publishers and business people, it's like you're training a chimpanzee how to use a nuclear weapon. Yeah, and they say like I remember. I remember going into meetings, and they would say, "Well, why would we want to publish a parody of Harry Potter? Who hates Harry Potter?" And I would say. Yeah, precisely. Nobody hates Harry Potter. It's a huge market of people who have a context. And then once you, in, once you have that shared context, you can really pretty much do whatever you want. But, you, you know, because you're, you're commenting on the original automatically. And the dichotomy there is that when you do a loving parody or when you do something that really taps into the fan base, yeah, that's when they don't sue, even though you're totally like borrowing their mojo to sell yeah. books. And that's yeah. when they should sue. When they sue... <laughs> Is when you do something so abhorrent that, you know, right. where you're using really shocking humor or something like that, right. that makes their thing associated with this horrible thing. And that's what the haters would like, but that's what would make you get sued. So that's a lose-lose. You know, I, I just would say, I don't think they should sue ever. I, I don't Ideally, think. Ideally, 
yeah. I, I don't. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't mean like. I don't mean like um, because I used to be a parodist. I mean like they shouldn't sue because it, the more in the bloodstream, the more they're going to sell. Like you, you know, I th- what was wonderful was that with with the Barry Trotter books is that I know that J.K. Rowling read them. I know that she liked them because we heard from my agent, heard from her agent, or however it went. That's great. Um, yeah, this was the best part. I wrote the first Barry Trotter between books four and five, and in Harry Potter five, six, and seven, there are jokes that if you read the Barry Trotter books, there are jokes in the real Harry Potter book, and I am so, I'm just, I was so touched by that, and I'm so appreciative that she got that I thought what she was doing was wonderful, and that what I hoped, what I hoped was that my books would be a way for fans to dig into her books more deeply and sort of think about that world more deeply and not say, oh, well, it's a a children's book or it's a fantasy book or whatever, so we can't really bring our full brains to it. In fact, no, we should bring our full brains to it, and there's some part of it where where we're talking, to be aware of the the constraints in, in the form, and because when she breaks them, like, for example, with Dumbledore being gay, uh, you know, that's tremendous. That's phenomenal. She's doing exactly what a postmodern author would do. Like that's right. And, and, and that's so much why people love it so much. And I think I was just really grateful because people got it, you know, because oftentimes with parody um, and comedy in general, people just don't get it. And I am so not a hater. I'm so interested in um, having fun. You know, for me, comedy is not necessarily about, heavy satire or, you know, putting the wood to somebody. There are lots of people who do that. For me, it's more about celebration and gener- generosity. That's just my nature. Your takeaways from your writing parody novels, period. Just like, what did you learn about that? What did you like about it? What, what did you take away from that? Um, well, when it worked well, it was very intimate. Um, when, it, when it worked well, meaning when my publisher didn't, my publisher had this habit of calling me up in August asking for books by October 1st. Yeah. So it was just, I had to just from us and I would say to them, I'd be like, but I, I wrote it to be done. Like it, I would have to, you know, come up with a plot and write it like a madman. But when I was able to select my targets, like I think my parody of Narnia was pretty good. I think, I think my parody of a Christmas Carol is pretty good. Um, I think that my parody of, um, uh, Downtown Abbey is pretty good. Barry Trotter always frustrated me because it was a first draft. That book that sold all those was a first draft because I was so embroiled in getting it out and I had to get it out that I wasn't able to really polish, polish it in the way I liked. Um, and of course no, no editor was taking it seriously. So you didn't get any sort of editorial feedback. That's another thing about bystander is I just want to give people who write in this form real big boy editorial comment, you know, like really like you guys did at the onion, obviously with each other. Like, really bring your full brains to it. How can this be good? That is so rare in, in print humor these days because there's no money in it and people don't respect it. When it worked well, when people got it, I, I loved it I, because I, I got fan letters from, from all sorts of incredible teenagers and kids, um, some of whom are still friends now. And I, I just love that. Um, I loved interacting with the audience in that way. And I particularly loved interacting with the audience and not in the online way. Because there's a kind of, uh, there's a kind of meanness that can happen online. There's a kind of sort of entitledness that can happen online. Um, but when you're writing an author a letter via his agent, gets to him six months later, whatever it is, and then, he, then I would always write them back. And it was very... Sweet, because I could, just like with the Yale Record kids, I could be encouraging and thoughtful, and I'm so glad you liked it. And, you know, it's kind of spreading the love. Nowadays, it's, and this is one of the reasons that Bystander doesn't have a real strong online presence, you know, it's, comment sections are trash. I mean, it's just like the worst, the worst, the worst of the worst, the worst instincts of everybody. So, yeah, so that's what I liked. I, I was of the belief, and I remember begging my English publisher the one I made all the money for. I remember begging him, just saying, listen, so you have three catalogs a year? Yeah. Okay, well, three times a year. You just you just tell me. We'll just look at what big movies are coming out or what big books are coming out, and we'll do a parody that's timed up that way. Let me do it. Let me Give me more than six weeks to do it. It's going to be great. 
I'll do a design so that it'll have it'll have a graphic environment around it. It's going to be awesome. Just just do this. I promise you, if you do it with me this way, we'll be able to pencil in a hundred thousand sales every single time. And they said, no, 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 we're not interested in that. We think it's a craze. So they 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 pumped out probably ten books, and their contrib- their competitors pumped out ten parodies over the course of you know six months, mostly by people who'd never done parody before. And so they sucked, and so people stopped buying them. And and I just remember, I remember at one point, my English publisher told me, I, I said to him, he rejected manuscripts, and I said, I just want to be clear about this. You're telling me that I can't sell a parody of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol at England, in, in England at Christmas time in your packaging with my name on it, where you can say over a million micro parodies in print? And he said, yeah, I don't think we can sell it. And I said, boy, you guys have done a number. And that is what book publishing is like. There's not a brain cell in it. I mean, forgive me, there's a lot of people that I like in book publishing, and I've met a lot of nice people, but the level of simple business sense or whatever you want to call it, uh, respect for the audience or, you know, just there's just, I don't know, it's, it's cynical or something, but it doesn't work. I don't mind businesses that are cynical if they actually get good product out to people. It's My wife is in television and that's as cynical as you get, but we're living through a golden age. If, you know, you, if people in print are cynical, you're like, dudes, it's time for you to change. Yeah, I feel like they make all their money from the big ticket authors and everything yeah. under that yeah. level is, then they get to sort of use their, their discretion, which is for shit. Agreed. And, and, it's, and it's, it's one of the reasons that I live in Santa Monica rather than New York, though I love New York. Uh, the publishing business felt like school to me. It felt like the worst aspects of Yale. It felt like people who were very, very concerned about how they looked, very, 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 very status conscious, um, money conscious in a weird way. Uh, it was entitled. I, I, didn't, I didn't like it. I, I didn't like it. I, I and they didn't like me. I mean, <laughs> let's let's be honest. No, I mean, seriously, Scott. I when I say this, when I say this stuff, uh, my Buddhist part comes out and says, "Well, you know, you played a role in this too." I just was not, and continued just not to be very well suited for for that business. I just happened to love writing and editing and publishing comedy. So with, um, after I did the the uh, getting back to this is an appropriate time to end this this part of my career. So I, I did this parody of Downton Abbey. I delivered them the book, and after saying, this is great, we love it, a week later, I get a call from my agent saying, they're turning it down. I said, are they giving you a reason? Nope. Do they have to give you a reason? Wait a minute, nope. they asked you to write it, right? Exactly. All right. They asked me to write it. And I said, well, do we have a contract? And they said, and my agent said, no, we were still working it out. And I said, well, you know, Edward, we have an email chain where they said that they were going to give me $35,000 to do this book if I got it to them by this date. I got it to them by this day. To my mind, that says they they at least owe me $35,000 if they don't want to publish it. Um, and he said, okay, I'll go back to them. He went back to them. They said, and, and, and the, uh, they, he told me, they offer, they're offering you $5,000 to put it in a drawer to never publish it. Oh, boy. And I said, well, fuck them for the $5,000 and fuck them for the non-publishing. And I'm gonna, this is a good book that people are going to like. So I kickstarted it. And kickstarted, but but I have to say, I was devastated by this. I was devastated by this because I had done everything that the publishing business had asked me to do, including gone to a goddamn Ivy League school, you know, like just like and done everything, and like like and you know, here I was at forty, literally with nothing to show for it, and um, because you know, if even if you sell a million books on million books. I go through the numbers. You know them because I'm so sure you saw those numbers for uh, for the Onion books. Mm-hmm. Everybody takes their little piece, and it's and it's a you make money like a a reasonably well paid lawyer for two years, and then you're back to nothing, zero. So um, so this is when my I think that reversal was so difficult for me. Was so I took it so personally and was so heartbroken. I really was heartbroken. Um, well, and it was wrong because they ha- had a deal memo, presumably like, that's just not yeah. cool. You just don't break those. Ag- agreed. And, you know, and what really killed me was that neither my public, no, neither my agent nor my, my lawyer who I was paying $450 an hour to vet me, you know, vet stuff. They wouldn't take me to, they wouldn't take them to court. 
And I say, we should sue them because we want to tell them not to do this to people. No, 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 not interested. And I, and yeah, as they, they say, don't want to piss in the bathwater, right? Ex- that's exactly right. Because they make all their money. Everybody makes all their money with the big six publishers, right? So you can be the, you can be the one agent who stands up for his clients, or you can be the one agent, one of the agents that makes a living. So, um, I self-published, I self-published that book, kickstarted it, but I was really retired and I was so ill that I thought I was going to die. This was around 2012. I had about five foods I could eat. I was eating, um, medical marijuana. I'd never tried marijuana. I have a slight case of cerebral palsy. So anything that makes you a little clumsy, (laughs) that's not for me. Um, but in any case, I was doing that. I was taking a high CBD tincture to, to keep my appetite up. Um, and I, I really, I was 42 and I really didn't know how I was going to continue on. And, um, funnily enough, I had a neighbor in here in Santa Monica and the neighbor said, why don't you go see my acupuncturist? And I said, I've done acupuncture for this and it made me feel better, but it didn't make me, it didn't stick. You know, it didn't make me feel better for real. It just made me feel better for that one day. I said, please go see this guy. And I saw him. He told me about this very rare, very intense kind of acupuncture called classical Chinese five element acupuncture of the Worsley school. And apparently what we know as TCM is what Mao ripped out of the, what, what was left after Mao had ripped out all the things he didn't like from the medical books. What the Worsley school people claim, and I think that there's certainly I'm living proof of this is that these are the full books that these are, this is the full art as practiced for 3000 years. All I can tell you is that 20, in 2011, 2012, I had no better ideas. I was meditating. I was going to Buddhist, uh, you know, Dharma talks as much as I could because I really felt I didn't know how much time I had left and I wanted to be as good a person as I could be uh, for as long as I could, could be that. So I put my hand, myself in the hands of this acupuncturist here in Santa Monica who is a Western trained neurologist. Um, so he's not somebody who waves crystals around or whatever. Forgive anybody who's listening who has had benefit with crystals. I don't mean any uh, disrespect. I just mean to say my acupuncturist was a Western trained person. So sometimes he would say, you don't need acupuncture. You need antibiotics or whatever. So that was very good. That reassured me. Anyway, the first year I felt worse and I would go in and I was going in twice a week and it was not cheap. My parents were helping. We were broke. Um, and I said, I, I don't know how much more of this I can take. And he just said, well, keep, keep coming, keep coming. And because I didn't have anything better, because I didn't know anything better, I just kept coming. Around October, I started feeling better. That was the first, that, so it was like 10 months. And around that time, I started thinking maybe I'm not going to die. But I certainly wasn't writing. I was still flat on my back. My head would spin I, even when I turned on my computer, I was completely wrecked. The idea of writing comedy where you just, just sort of launch yourself at the page, couldn't do it. Totally was, was retired, but more than that, like, like done. I looked at my career as a done thing, that I'd done certain things and I was able to do them. I was happy to do them. But that person was not here anymore. And so what was interesting was around that time, Brian McConaughey, who's a comedy writer, who is, uh, was, is the only person I know who did the National Lampoon, the National Lampoon Radio Hour, Saturday Night Live, and SCTV. He got in touch with me, and he asked me, he said, have you ever done a podcast? Could you help me do a podcast? And I said, Brian, I don't know anything about podcasts. I can help you do a magazine if you want to do a magazine, because I'd been, you know, when I was so ill, I, the one thing I still could do was talk to students. I still could talk to college kids about what they wanted to do, and how, they, how I could help them do that. Now, wait a minute. How did McConaughey know or think to contact you about the a podcast? Because he had, I had sent him a copy uh, of my parody of uh, Christmas Carol. Oh, okay. And because uh, I thought he would like it. I thought it was his style and he would like it. And he did like it and he wrote me. And then after he wrote me, I said, oh, do you want to do, like you said, a master's team, the Yale record? I think the kids would like you. And the students there at that time were my a particular favorite bunch of mine, uh, particularly great guys. So I wanted to them to meet Brian, and you know, always I'm always trying to hook them up with people who can give them the real deal, who can who can break them out of the tyranny of the now with comedy, and say no, no, this is 
So, you know, no, go, go watch, you know, go listen to Bob and Ray or whatever it is. Um, so he knew me through that too. And that's how he, he contacted me. He and he and a, his, his good friend, Alan Goldberg, who's been, who's the third musketeer of this whole thing. And so he said, you know, uh, I tried to start a magazine called the American Bystander in 1982. It never got anywhere. I mean, it got to the pilot issue. We printed up some, but we couldn't get them on the newsstands. Just as you and I were talking at the beginning, yeah. he said we didn't have a million dollars. You know, it was interesting. It was, in, and the original bystander. That's this is a whole other conversation. It's a really interesting mix because it's sort of half the New Yorker and half classic lampoon. A lot of the contributors are classic lampoon people, but Brian, being more whimsical, more personal, um, less overtly satirical, he was. Uh, his, the texture of his pilot issue was very much himself. It was very much like Brian and Bruce McCall and Jack Handy and all that stuff. So Brian said to me, well, I understand you're too ill to do it, but, but would, you, would you just sort of write up some thoughts about how you would do it, how you would fund it, how you would run it editorially? Sure, I'll do that. It took me months, you know. Because I literally couldn't. I mean, I didn't have it. I was so weak. As I get stronger, I was able to do it more quickly. He reads this thing. He goes, oh, I like this. You know, so who would you get? You know, and I start, okay, let me come up with a staff list. Oh, you know, hey, would you, uh, would you call that person? Because Brian is very shy. Would you, call, you know, would you call George Meyer and see if he has material? Yeah, okay, I'll do that. And so this was a period of about two years where, three years, where, you know, he got me to do the things one by one by one, and I was getting stronger and stronger. There was a year where I was doing just iterations of the design, you know, like typeface tests and page tests, and I would go to um, the, the Santa Monica Public Library down the street and look at old magazines from the late 70s and early 80s, the ones that I particularly like, um, and see what I could use. Oh, they're using rules like that. I'd go to UCLA and I'd go into their special collections and I'd look for um, magazines, you know, like uh, um, newspaper, underground newspapers. So how are they doing that? Um, because I was thinking about, well, how would you do a magazine that felt like a big professional magazine, but you just do it yourself or you do it with a very, very small group of people? Because I knew we'd have no money um, if, if it actually happened. But I wasn't even thinking that it would actually happen. I was thinking at, always at this time. I was thinking, how can I put this together to give it to Brian, to give it to Brian and whoever else he gets, and I'll just be the guy in the, in the history of it someday, you know, the, the consultant. Because I was a magazine consultant in my 20s when I was writing humor for The New Yorker and all those people, what I, what I did for a living. I was in meetings with people at Lampoon and Spy when they were going down for the count, and they would ask me what to do, and I would tell them, and then they would do the opposite, and they'd go out of business. I remember... The guy who owned Spy in 1998 was the heir to the Coleman mustard throne. And um, his, I had a meeting with him once, and he was auditioning me, at, me to be editor-in-chief. And he said, at the end, he said, well, you seem like a very nice chap, but you just don't seem clever enough. And what we need for someone running this magazine is someone who's bloody clever. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm glad that you knew. I'm glad, I'm glad that you discovered this early. <laughs> So, so anyway, a lot of uh, comedy genius in the Coleman mustard. Exactly. Well, you know, you know what? I looked at the guy and I was like, God bless you, because this is the kind of person that's kept the magazine business alive for 150 years. You know, I, I just, just the thing is, he's no different than Raoul Fleischman, but Raoul Fleischman was smart enough to hire the right person and let him do his thing. And you know what I mean? It's like, so God bless him, but <laughs> wherever, wherever he might be. But um, so we finally got to the point where I had a dummy. I had a, I had a, a it was a pony really. It was like a short version of a dummy, uh, like 24 pages. There was a, there was a guy, a friend, from, a friend of Brian's, a high school friend of Brian's, who's, a, who's a very prominent fellow, um, and he believed that he could get us a million dollars from China, and so we spent a, a, a year having meetings with this fellow and doing proposals. That was me doing proposals and sending, you know, dummies and all that sort of thing, sending, sending ponies you know, uh, off to whomever. And um, it turned out that that deal fell through, as they all did, as they all do always. And um, so as of fall 2015, 
I had this book because I thought it's not going to be advertising focused. It's going to be reader focused because that's what common comedy magazines really thrive under reader focus. Um, it can't be, it can't be newsstand focused really. Cause that, as we know, is very capital intensive crooked and you have no idea whether they're screwing you or not. Um, and I can go into that if you think your readers, if your listeners would be interested in why, but in any case, I really looked at the book. I looked at that. I was going to make it feel like a magazine, but it was going to be a book because it was going to be durable. It was going to have an on sale, um, on sale lifespan of forever. And that people would pay for something that was, was permanent or felt permanent in a way that they wouldn't pay for a magazine. And so with a book, I could also charge what I needed to charge to be able to make a buck on it because the whole point of doing this was to pay the writers and artists and to let them have their the rights, to give them a better deal, to, to think about all the times that I've been screwed in my own career and try to get them to get a better deal and through that better deal, deal, give them leverage against the other people that they might be getting contracts from and say, listen, the bystander gives us full rights. Um, and I also felt that after self-publishing these books, Barry Trotter, Christmas Peril, Downtown Abbey, I knew how to do that. After kickstarting Downtown Abbey, I knew how to do that. I thought, well, we have this first issue. I don't think there's, I'm not going to do this for free again for the millionth time. I, and, and my health, I don't want to, str- I don't want to stress my health. I can't. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this one issue. We're going to kickstart it. And I don't expect anybody to give me a dime for it. It just seems so weird and out of there, out there. And, you know, everybody in the publishing business has always told me that people hate print humor, if, unless it's the onion, but that's really because it's shareable and it's, timely and it's short and that's why they like it but anything else people don't want it so you know what do i know they're they're professional problems so um when i hit the the launch button on the first kickstarter i had no great belief that we would fund i put twenty five thousand dollars because that's what we needed to uh to print it and pay everybody a dime or two um and we made that in four days and it kept going until over forty thousand dollars now, to and what people do you attribute start, that success on Kickstarter? Nobody else was doing that. Like they, think cause, they, just because it was original. I think because I think because it was original. I think because it was original. I think because I have spent. I think because with the bystander and, and anything else I were to do, I think that that I've been obsessed with this stuff forever. You know, so it's like, so um, you know, the kind of decisions that I'm making are completely different than, than decisions that you're going to make, that you would find people making in Time Inc. or, or even Spy, you know, back in the day. Like, so I think that there, I think that there's, the, I think there was a great hunger and remains a great hunger for this type of material. I think there's a huge gap in our culture, which the print publishing business is allowed to happen for a bunch of reasons that I can go into. But there's a gap in our culture, which this fills. There's, there's, a, there's a couple of different constituencies that we seem to be satisfying. One is people who love the old magazines. People like you, you know, okay, so people like that. Then there are people like you and me, people in the comedy business. And comedy is much bigger than it's ever been before. Comedy is, you know, it's huge in yeah, a way. Almost even, even, everybody's in the comedy business now. Isn't that the truth? And it fucking, doesn't it kind of piss you off? You know, you're like, Hey, I thought it was doing something kind of special. Now everybody's doing, everybody's got a show on Netflix or whatever it is, or whether yeah, it's in a way it's good. I think lot. for the comedy audience, it's good because yeah. there's so much comedy, but a place like Twitter where yeah. somebody's best joke they've ever thought of in their entire life is out there competing with professional comedians every day. And so it's just a, it's a glut. But yes. Again, again, it's a, it's an embarrassment of riches for the audience, but it makes it a little more difficult when you're trying to make a living at it. And also breaking through, like like this yeah. is the this is the thing. I think that the biggest problem with bystander is is not the quality of the product or the or the response. The quality, I think, if you allow me, I think is pretty high. I and agree. It's very thank good. you, I appreciate that. I do my fucking best, man, and I'm trying to make it better. Uh, that's all I can say. Uh, and, but then the other thing is too, like the reaction has been great. 
but getting people to see it or getting people to know about it is so hard. It's so hard because there's a blizzard of stuff coming at them. And if I'm a person and I say, hey, you should check out my wonderful comedy magazine with Meryl Marco and Jack Handy, and I put that up on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, like the people who know Meryl or Jack or whatever, people like you and me, they would go, oh, that's kind of neat. But but the amount of content that just gets shoveled at people these days is 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 daunting to say the least. I, one of the things that I think that bystander can do is it can winnow that a little bit. You can say, look, you know, you don't have to browse Twitter constantly for the gems or you don't have to, you know, um, search however you can to get good stuff. This is a way, a one-stop shop where the advertising, the bystander is advertising for stuff that we like, stuff that we know is good uh, and or stuff that our contributors do are doing. So we're always trying to create this walled garden where bystander gets the reader and gets the, you know, gets the person, and then we start to introduce you to the entire world. And that will, um, we hope, will make it easier for our individual cr- creators, our individual contributors, to make a living doing this kind of stuff. And that's where, when you said with the onion, you feel that the bystander is, is, has an onion sort of aesthetic, I'm, look- I'm always looking at it like, how can I help this person who is a really funny writer who hasn't maybe broken through or is, is done this great book that isn't getting promoted because no books get promoted. How do we, you know, like that's what I wake up in the middle of the night doing is thinking about that. So um, people were very happy that there was something like this happening. I think that my instinct was to load this up as a murderer's row, like the ultimate staff um, mixing old and new, old and young um, male and female, uh, trying to get us, you know, trying to, if, if you have any interest in this stuff, letting there be no doubt that there's, that this is worth your time. Um, and I also think, you know, I had cultivated years and years and years of connections in the comedy business and magazine business and personally like record friends and things. And so people knew that I loved this stuff. And so they were, they wanted to support what I was doing. And that's, that's a huge part of it. Of Kickstarter. What we're trying to do now is convert from a Kickstarter Indiegogo kind of model, where it's Aunt Tilly giving you a hundred dollars because you're her nephew, to to Patreon, where it's really a subscription model, um, and that's more sustainable. So, in any case, yeah. Once one came out, then people started clamoring for two, and then they could start clamoring for three, and now four. It's interesting because every project that I've ever done up to this one was me pushing the rock up the hill. Now it's more like that scene in Indiana Jones where the rock is rolling and I'm running as fast as I freaking can in front of the rock. Um, so I'm going, and I'm going to New York this week to, you know, meet up with the staff. So yeah, it's, it's, it's been quite an experience and, and to have, you know, somebody like you who I've always admired your work and, um, Thank you. and kept an eye on what you were doing to contact me and say, Hey, let's talk. It's, it's really shows that, that um, this is worth doing, whether it's me that's doing it or somebody else. I, I really, I want to create an institution that will last a hundred years. Uh, and well, that's where the commodity is, you know, it's, it's the longevity. If you, and now with this glut of information on the internet that we were talking about, it's the thing that's been around for a long time that's known that has a reputation as a curator of fine comedy, presumably, right. or at least that's what everybody says, that's the thing that's going to thrive and survive as long as it can keep going, you know, longevity right. being probably the most important thing in media. Well, isn't that interesting, you know, because I'm really trying to, because with the record, I had to set up a publishing and editorial model for people who were drunk most of the time. That's, that's not fair, but you know what I'm college kids. College kids. Yeah. They're not um, the most reliable. Ones. Yeah. And you know, college humor magazine people, you know, this from your days. Sure. Uh, so I'm always thinking with the bystander, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, is this can this just run? And and I think that I think that every week I'm putting in more stuff that says, yeah, this can run. My interest, it's so interesting because I was just saying this to somebody yesterday. He asked me, he said, What is your editorial credo? And I said, Oh my God, I don't think in those terms. But what I will tell you is this. Usually a human magazine, the, the great ones, and I would say things like Kurtzman's Mad or uh, Kenny and Beard's Lampoon, or um, uh, Graydon Carter and Kurt Anderson's Spy, 
in your guys' onion. I don't, I don't know who to say besides you because you were so good at hiding who you were, but your guys. It's, it's a small group of people who sort of get together in a pressurized situation and a certain aesthetic comes out. And it's very strong and it's very clear. And if, if you like it, great. If you don't, fine. But with bystander, it's not like that at all. And I've done that on purpose because one, I don't, I'm at the point in my career, I'm 48. I'm not 27. I'm not, you know, full of prove it anymore. I've done what I've done. Um, Secondly, I don't want it to be about me and and my aesthetics necessarily. People like it, that's fine. But but that's the the, um, the sort of auteurist uh, magazine editor thing though it's, it's great for the ego, it doesn't produce magazines that last, and I'm really interested in producing a magazine that lasts. So I said, instead of the 24 perfect red roses, which is what something like, say, Spy 1985 is, from the design to the front editorial, it's, you know, somebody said to me, Kurt was writing those editorials in 1976 at the Harvard Lampoon. I said, of course he was, because that's his voice. That's, you know, like, that's who he is. That, I thought, no... In the age of the internet, people can go, they're being trained to strong flavor, click past, click to another strong flavor, click to another strong flavor, click to another strong flavor. So how do we make something that will last? Well, instead of those 24 perfect red roses, we want, and I say this is, I edit for a perfect bouquet of wildflowers. Each flower, perfect, a perfect expression of that particular writer or artist. That's all I want. If I can do that, then I'll sequence it in a way so that it will put it all put it all to its best advantage. And that's how the design works, and that's how the book the bookiness of it works. And uh, that seems to be working. I'm very excited about that, that because that's something new in print humor magazines. Yeah, I've not seen it. It's a great analogy for what you're doing and the vibe of the magazine. Thanks. I'm really glad you you feel that way because that's really me personally as well. That I don't have I was never I was never interested in being the funniest person in the room, and I think that that also was part um, that was also part of the uh, the uh, record thing, where I had to run it, I had to create it, I had to I couldn't I couldn't um, concern myself with that. I had to get the magazine done, so I was tr- always trying to gather more talent, gather more talent, gather more talent, and that's one of the reasons why television and movies was such a, a dead end for me is that when I would go into writer's rooms or whatever, I was, in a, I was on a show a couple years ago, and it was great. I mean, I needed the money, and I, and I, I wished everybody well. But I, I was just like, oh, my God, because I don't pitch very well, and, and, and I, just, I just do what I do as, as best as I can do. But I don't have this driving, this craving to be the funniest person in the room, the kind of dominating thing. It, uh, that always used to drive me nuts. It always made me feel like that person was insecure. And what I want is to be the editor, to be someone who's, who's getting all that material and going, how do I make that sing? How do I make that person look even better? How do I make, it's almost like an improv, supporting your teammates kind of thing. That's just always the way I've done it. Well, it's funny to hear you say that because you need an idiosyncratic voice. If you're going to have any chance of breaking through, you can't just ape other things that you've seen. Mm-hmm. And, um, mm-hmm. That's obviously what you're doing. You're living your mission. You've been doing this since you were five years old and you're still doing <laughs> that's it, true. which is great. Like that's what it takes, I think. So it's been awesome talking to you, Michael. Yes. I would be remiss if I didn't ask what happened with your illness. Were you ever diagnosed? Where, where are you at now with it? Well, thank you. I really appreciate you um, talking about that because I don't think that by, well, bystander wouldn't have happened if I hadn't gone through this, this process. Um, I'm a, fundamentally different person. I mean, I'm not the same person, of course, but I'm much happier. I'm much more open, um, much more generous, much less scared. And so much of comedy, both how it is created and the industry that you find yourself in, encourages a kind of fear, uh, a kind of closeness, a misery. It's comedy for many people, myself included, was a sort of medicine that we discovered early in our lives to make ourselves feel a little better. But the problem is, is the, more, the longer you take it, the more you have to take, the bigger your, do- your dose is. So, you know, you get the Michael O'Donoghue effect, where if we look at Michael O'Donoghue, we say, wonderful writer. 
you know, wonderful writer, gave people, gave people so much pleasure. Look at his life. Was that a happy person? Is that, is that a life that you would really wish on anybody that you cared about? And from my perspective, Dennis Perrin, a friend of mine who's his biographer, for me, he may differ. But I look at Dennis and say, no, I, you know, I, wouldn't, I want Michael O'Donoghue or Doug Kenny or any of these people, I want them to be happy. I want them to get a, some kind of piece of, you know, some small piece of the pleasure that they put out in the world. I want them to feel that. That's important. And that's a lot of what Bystander is about. And then I'm trying to find people trying to find writers, trying to nurture them, the older writers that I love, that we all love, to try to, you know, help them along, the younger people. Getting back to my illness, they didn't ever, they weren't ever able to diagnose anything. Um, I think, like I said earlier, I think that it was more, they figured out the proximate causes. Um, What I think it was, was a chronic inflammation. And I think in part, it was a chronic inflammation that was, uh, you know, that was biological. It was a chronic inflammation that was psychological. That came from uh, the practice of writing comedy as I used to, which was visualize the disturbing. You know, it's two in the morning, you got to think of a joke. Think of the worst thing that could ever happen to you. You know, you're going to fall through. A, you know the old thing about uh, uh, Mel Brooks where he says, Tragedies when I cut my finger. Comedy is a, when you fall in a manhole, in an open manhole and die. You know, and if you make that joke, you're making a joke about falling into an open manhole, and you know this better than anybody, you're, where the humor will be is, what does it smell like down there? How did you get down there? Like the specifics. You have to put your mind down there as if you had, had that happen. And I think just for me, it was very psychologically difficult. Um, I am in total remission. I am totally healthy. Uh, I can now work as hard as I ever worked, and I'm getting stronger and stronger and stronger. I just had acupuncture earlier today, which is why I've been motor mounting for an hour. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's wonderful. I have a lot of vitality. Whenever I run into somebody who has um, an illness that has to do with the immune system or, or anything that Western medicine doesn't really handle very well or tends to handle with a lot of drugs, I always try to tell them about this type of acupuncture because it's getting more common. And it freaking works. I mean, I came at it with no uh, preconceived notions, and it, and it works. I also do Qigong, which is a kind of Chinese yoga, um, which seems to, is very benign. Um, and it, 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 even with my cerebral palsy, I can do it very well. Uh, and that is giving me more and more strength. So, yes, it, it's, life is good. If bystanders stopped tomorrow, life would be great. Um, but, but, you know, I plan on doing this for as long as, I, as, as people want me to do it. And uh, if I'd like to get more people going to the Patreon because if we get to 3,000, it's basically unkillable. Um, but, you know, even if we never get very big at all, I, I, the fact that people like you, people whose work I admire and, and taste, I respect, get it. You know, they get it. Maybe it's not exactly how they do it, but they're getting it. You go, this is all that's I ever a, wanted. That's a great measure so of success. It's, it's, um, that, that, that you could lose it and <laughs> still be happy. Like, I, I don't know if a lot of people in comedy oh. would say that. Well, you know, that's the thing, because I did lose yeah, it. Yeah, so you've been to the Because I did side. lose it. Yeah, I mean, I've been, you know, I've, I've been uh, it's, I, writing for The New Yorker and getting in their Fierce Pajamas collection and all that stuff. I'm working for SNL and being a producer said that, that John and I were the most prolific Alp staff contributors in the history of Weekend Update. I don't know. Maybe he tells that to everybody. But you know, the Barry Trotter thing, selling all those books. It's like I got to a certain point where I was like, okay, you know, I, I did what I wanted to do. Now we try to figure out how to help, how to, how to blaze a trail or make it easier for other people. The record has been a big thing for me in that way. And now with the bystander and just trying to stick with, you know, the integrity of that. Uh, and I think you can't go too far wrong if you know who you are and, 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 you, and you try to stick to the integrity. Agreed. Well, it's been a delight and an inspiration to talk to you, Michael. Really appreciate your time. And continued success. I look forward to many oh. more years and decades of The American Bystander. Well, thank you. Tell all your friends, because really at this point, every single person who, who subscribes or, or buys back issues makes a difference. And we do... And and I do take it as a real personal vote of confidence. So thank you so much, Scott. I really appreciate it.
Thank you so much for listening to the How to Write Funny podcast. If you like what you hear and you get it on iTunes, please go leave a review. It helps us out and it helps other people discover it.